Go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Masood, for inviting me for this event, which I've never done on Google Meet or Meet Google or whatever it's called. So um, what I would like to do today is I would like to give you um, a fairly brief introduction to the WebTel database. I won't talk about the history of it because I did that in uh, uh, Jayapur Gayasta's uh, Facebook feed like a few weeks ago, so you can watch that on YouTube as well. And there's also a little bit of information published in her preview in other places. So instead, what I would like to do today is I, I just give you a little bit of background of why we do that, why we have a reptile database, and um, what you can do with it, and also how you can participate or contribute to the database and to this actually a community effort uh, of the help community. So, so the first reason why we want a reptile database is what you can see in the next slide. So simply, uh, there is one reason, the same reason why you keep photos in an album but not in the shoebox. You just want to organize your stuff somehow. And since we have 13,000 reptile species and subspecies, it's a good idea to organize this information somehow. You can also see another reason, uh, same thing, you know, you want to keep papers in a computer instead of a pile of papers. And um, um, you will see later on how many papers have been published on reptiles or on reptile taxonomy for that purpose. One more reason, you want to have scientifically reliable data somehow available in a database uh, on top of the actual papers not just on social media websites where a lot of people get their information from these days but that's not a bad thing but you know for science data it's probably not a very good place to find information at least and finally you want to work with data also instead of just collecting it right so on the left hand side there's just one example so you see a, a map of reptile species richness in Africa and Europe and the Middle East, which is a compilation of a lot of different studies. And you can see basically where a lot of reptile species are, which are the red area. So it's basically a summary of a lot of papers just collapsed into one diagram. Um, so that's actually, that's actually more concentrated than just having a database, which often uh, provides a list of species. And you know, in some cases, you don't want to have a list of stuff you want have graphical representation, so that's what you can see here in this case. You can also see uh, just a representation of the general problem we have. We seem to have too much data, you know, we have, but so we know we have at least two million species described and many millions that have not been described yet. Um, we also have a total of more than 50 million papers published, and I'm talking about scientific papers in general. Um, some people say there are 2 million biomedical papers published a year, um, which adds up to these 50 million. Um, you can also see, uh, you will see this in a second, but you can see here that we have 11,000 species and 2,500 subspecies of reptiles, but they, of course, they only make up a very small fraction of all the living species in the world. So, uh, so the reptiles are only about half a percent of all species that we know right now. I try to get an idea of how many papers are published about reptiles. Um, and, you know, I guess that there are probably about 10,000 papers published a year. That's my rough guess. Um, there may be other tens of thousands of other documents published. What we do in the reptile database, we collect about 2,000 out of these 10,000. Um, because many of them are, of course, they are more popular signs of them. There are in areas which are not closely you know, related to a taxonomy. So we usually ignore all the papers which are about, or we ignore many papers which are published in ecology or behavior or physiology, this kind of stuff. So you won't find these papers usually in the reptile database. So we try to focus on the taxonomic literature, which is about a fifth or so, I, that's my estimate, of all the 10,000 papers published a year. Um, you get just a quick rundown of what kind of information we try to extract from these 2,000 papers, which are descriptions, pictures, which of course we cannot capture from papers, although in some cases we can do that if they are um, published under a common, a Creative Commons license. 
We uh, try to extract mapping or geographic distribution data. We have links to DNA sequences in GenBank. We have some ecology data, such as some diet information, some di information about predators, um, a little bit about behavior, but that's all things we like to have, okay? So we don't have much of that stuff, especially in the, the areas of ecology, behavior, and physiology. Um, so that's one of the things we would like to have information. And we, I mean, like a lot of people like you, I mean, you are interested in snake ecology. So the people who are interested in these areas, they of course want much more information than we can provide. And that's of course already pointing out a big uh, issue we have because we need people who actually extract that kind of stuff from people. So I come to that problem in a second. So, so you realize that we do need a database to collect all this information because there's a, a lot of you know literature out there and um, it's it's possible that you can read, of course, you know, many papers, but it's it's much more difficult to organize all this information in a searchable format. So, so the first problem we have, we have to get information from these papers somehow into a computer. Okay, so that's the basic problem we have. Yeah. So, so this process is called curation. You know, and there, are, you know, by now there are literally hundreds of people who are actually active in this area of medical or biomedical literature curation the databases. There's even an international society for uh, bio-curation, which has a couple of hundred members, which do nothing else than deal with how to get data from papers into databases. So as you can imagine, you know, a lot of stuff is published, but it's not really easily searchable. You can, of course, always Google stuff, but if you search, for example, what are the prey items that species X is eating. You know, you may find 50 papers which mentions species X and prey items and whatever food in general, but you know, then you have to go through all these papers, you know, and figure that out. So that's the kind of problem we are dealing with. Um, on top of all the papers, we of course we do get other information from certain other databases. So for example, we have these links to uh, the NCBI taxonomy, which provides a link to DNA sequences, which you of course need if you have phylogenetic studies, for example, so you need access to that. So we're going to take care of that because, of course, people submit their sequence information directly to the sequence database. So they, will, they would never sequence anything to, to our database. So you need other databases which you either use to uh, um, import data or you just link to these databases. And finally, we get quite a bit of information um, from people like you, like users who send us information, like nature photographers who take pictures, you know. We will read 15,000 images in the next uh, release of the reptile database, and the vast majority of those have been submitted by, you know, about, it's close to 1,000 people now who have submitted images. Yeah, so these are images which we get from people. People also send us directly information, such as, you know, location information, for example other things. We probably have at least a thousand personal communications in the reptile database, which are all just submitted stuff by um, by people who send me emails or whatever, you know, so just add that stuff. You can see it's just a collection of various sources we have used or still use for getting information. So it's just a rundown. If you go clockwise, you see iNaturalist, which many of you use for um, uploading pictures. You see Nature, so we have links to our naturalist pictures, so they have about 5,000 species, but they also use our um, taxonomy and our names and nomenclature, you know, to update their naming system. So, so it's a two-way uh, thing. So we also have information, of course, uh, coming from uh, collection databases. You see WorldNet, that's like about four o'clock in that uh, clockwise orientation, which is a, one of the collection databases which has actual specimens from museums. So we get certain information from them, and they probably use um, I mean, our taxonomy again. We have links to the red list system, so they um, assess reptile species for conservation purposes and produce those red lists. Uh, we, we provide data to the catalog of life, and they link back to us. Uh, I mentioned also the NCBI taxonomy and uh, the nucleotide, uh, nucleotide database, which you see in the left gen bank. These are two databases which are important for a lot of taxonomists. And of course, on the top left, you see the primary literature from um, which most of our information actually comes from. 
uh, if you click one down, you see also that all of these databases are in various ways cross-linked. Yeah, so these are basically all the different ways we exchange, receive, and send data to other databases. And these are just some of them. There are others, for example, which I have mentioned. So one of them is the um, Encyclopedia of Life, for example. We have a lot of links in Wikipedia and all these things. So there's many others. These are just like a small subset. But you see that it's really critical these days that you update and exchange information with, with a lot of other sources, because you cannot curate all that information yourself. So the question is now, so we have a bunch of data sets in the database, so what can you do with it? And so I just give you a couple of examples and see um, one entry in the reptile database, which you can see online. One of the things which you don't see in the middle is a map, but let's go to that in a second, okay? So I just mentioned that we have 15,000 photos or so, and we have links to probably about 20,000 additional photos. So in, in places such as Flickr or Cal Photos or other places. Um, I don't have a clear idea of how many species have been illustrated in photos online, but we're working on a database of photos right now. So that's one problem we are working on right now. So we have on top of that, of course, our names and synonyms. We have distribution data for um, pretty much all species, at least in terms of countries, and um, often smaller subunits of geographic information such as states in the US or provinces in China, places like that. We do have all the range maps, but they are currently not shown. So as you remember, we did have maps um, a year or two ago, and we removed them simply for the reason that Google actually made showing their maps not free anymore. So they actually charged you like about a year or two ago for showing their maps. So that's one reason. That's the main reason why we removed the maps. But we are working to replace the maps. So pretty soon, hopefully later this year, you will actually get maps online as well again. Okay, so we can also see the range maps. And they will be better than the, the ones which we had previously, which only showed the countries, okay? Um, we also have type information, which means like the specimens in museum, if you want to study the types. We don't have information about all the other specimens. So for those information, you have to go to some of the uh, databases such as WordNet or GB for some of the other databases. Um, as I, I mentioned before, we also work on more biological data, such as reproductive uh, information, for example, if a species is viviparous or oviparous, for example. We have descriptions for about 4,500 species, which means mostly diagnoses, but also more other descriptions from the, from the, um, from the literature. So that's also one thing which needs more data, but uh, that, that's not trivial to get, but I, I will get into this later on. Um, overall, we have 50,000 references uh, in the database now, and uh, about 20,000 of them have links to online versions of these papers. So you literally can find the papers and download them in many cases, but not all cases, because many of them are behind paywalls. So you still have to find those papers somewhere else. Um, and of course, I've mentioned the links to external databases, so I don't have to go into uh, more detail here, but there, these links are usually at the bottom of a page. All right, so that's basically what you can find, you know, in the database now. Of course, it's getting more interesting once you can search for these things in, in various combinations. So you can use our advanced search to combine stuff. You can search for all the snakes in the Mexican state of Sonora, in this case, you know, if you do that, you get a list of species and so on. I don't have to show you all this because you can do this yourself, and you can combine these other things. Unfortunately, we have not in, uh, implemented searches for data which is summarized or collected in our common field, so that's one thing we have to do in the future, okay? So we can also search for habitat types or, like, sizes, okay? So we have, for example, all the size information, like the maximum, sizes of, uh, of species, but you cannot search for these things right now explicitly, all right? Uh, I think you can see uh, an example of what you can do in using the quick search box at the main page at the bottom. So you can type in all kinds of stuff in that box, such as author names, taxa names, places, or you can type venomous, for example, to find venomous snakes. But you can also search for other things, which is not quite obvious. You can search for, you know, biological features such as you know, reproductive information, parthenogenesis, for example. We can search for di uh, diagnoses or habitat, all these kind of things. 
as I said, I mean, there's more information database that you can search because some of these things uh, are not yet broken out into their separate search fields or data fields. But that's something you often have, but it will come eventually online. You have to keep in mind that the reptile database currently has no funding. So this is all done by volunteers, basically. So it's a bit more difficult, you know, to implement all that stuff without um, significant funding. I mentioned a couple of things, what we like to do in the future, but I give you also some additional ideas, you know, and some of these things are not far away. So we will eventually get a new interface because like the current um, homepage we have, it's literally based on 1990s technology. I coded that in HTML like 25 years ago when I started Reptile Database as a grad student and it still looks the same, which is a bit stale now and not quite up to date to today's standards and web technology and all this stuff. So that will come also sometime soon, all right? Just in case you have waited for that for 25 years. One of the things uh, a lot of people say they are interested in is a feature where you can search range maps besides just seeing them, but also searching for characters like color and pattern and size to ID species. And that's something we have been working on for some time. We have a prototype which is not available yet, but it's it's working already. And if you go to the next slide, you see some ideas what you can do or what you will be able to do. So, so what you should be able to do pretty soon is you should be able to click a place on a map, um, and then you should be able to enter like the color pattern by just clicking a bunch of colored boxes. And then select the pattern, you know, in this case for snakes, you know, uniform or banded or whatever, striped species, and the size of the snake, okay? So we have done that information, we have coded that information for all the Australian species, which is why you see this right now. And we have done it for all the European snake species, so you should be able to, to search for those pretty soon. So when you enter all that stuff, um, you get just basically a couple of snakes. You can go to the next slide just to see an example, okay? This is not a... A real output, but you will see a bunch of pictures which basically match these criteria which you enter to see which are the best candidates for your species. And then you can click and add the one um, which matches these criteria, and then you can see more information. So that's the idea. So this is uh, going a bit further to the future. Eventually, we want to have uh, much more information about the characters, such as you know what all the stuff you can see here right now, like really detailed morphological characters mapped to different genera, for example, in this case. So you should be able to search for these things to really identify genera, but also species. But that's a, a much bigger project, of course, and that, that will take a while. Um, but we have started to do this for geckos. That's why the geckos are shown here. You know, so we haven't done that for snakes yet. In the next slide, you also see a picture where you can see a couple of these characters. Uh, so for geckos, of course, like the feet are important, so you see all these, um, you know, toe uh, pads and lamella and all these things. So um, you need, of course, all of these things for lots of different species and genera, you know, to illustrate all this stuff. But you see, this was also the reason why I spent a lot of time over the past year to take about 10,000 pictures in various collections to just like document all of these characters and all. So, so we have a lot of pictures, which you also cannot see yet, but these things will go, will go online at some point in the near future. So one of the things, of course, once once you have these features, you know, it's like the topaz and geckos, we also have, of course, phylogenetic trees, which are published. Um, then you can combine these things. You can, for example, map characters to phylogenies, for example. So you see how different characters and species have evolved and how they have diverged over time and they how they map to different phylogenetic groups and that kind of stuff. So this is another stud, study we have done. This is from Tony Gamble's group, but it just gives you an idea of what you can do once you have this kind of information. Of course, a lot of people like John Murphy uh, has collected these kind of things, but you know, it's, it's of course much easier to use once you have a database that you can use and download and search for these kind of things. So these are just a few more examples you know what you can do with with all this data. So the left and top left side you see snake body sizes, which are the the small hump which have the arrow, the green bars are lizards, the, the red arrow group, that's uh, the group under the red arrow, these are the snake body sizes. You see that snakes are much larger in terms of body mass compared to lizards overall. You can also do stuff like reptile longevity. I mean, we don't have this information yet in the in the database, but this is this is all data from Shai Mary's group. But um, 
So eventually we'll have this information as well, you know. Same for species richness, bottom left, you see, for example, where are all the birds in Africa and where are all the snakes in Africa. So that already gives you an idea how you can combine different data sets to find out trophic relationships. I mean, which snake eats which bird, of course. Of course a snake can only eat a bird which is close by or which is in the same range. And so these are things which you can study, which, which I mean, you can already see some patterns where there's a lot of snakes, there's usually also a lot of birds. So, so that often helps. And on the, in the, in the uh, bottom right picture, you see a map of how uh, species densities are affected by farming. And you see like in the top right in Australia, you see in Queensland and New South Wales, you know, there's large areas which may have quite a few species which are affected by farms. So these are all things which you can do once you have all the distribution information and um, all this taxonomic information. All right, so these are all basically views into the future. These are things which you cannot do directly in the database yet, but you can use the information in the database to some extent to do this already. Okay, so that's already a starting point. So now we come to the question, of course, how can you as a user or um, biologist or layperson, whatever, you know, how can you participate and contribute to the database, which of course always will help other people too. The major question is of course how we get data into the database from papers. So one thing you can do, of course, if you publish papers, you can send us papers or you can send us the information from your papers. But you can also, you know, volunteer to curate papers from the literature. We have a small team of about 20 people who do that more or less regularly, you know, so you don't have to do this, you just know, you know, obligation to do that, but if you read one or two or three or whatever papers a year or a week, you can just like basically extract the information that's interesting to you and potentially interesting to the database and just email that to me and I can add it to the database. There's no way right now to enter that stuff directly into the web database, but that's something we may also implement at some point. Um, so you just do a quick rundown. It's the same thing here what you have seen before. These are the kind of types of information we need. We need photos, we need names, distribution information, biological data, and especially the biological data, which is a bit sparse right now. So we need more stuff about that. So we have all the reproductive modes, but there's very little information about diet, for example. So you have papers about what snakes eat, just send us like some text files and we can import that. Um, same thing for diagnosis or descriptions, we can add that stuff. Um, eventually, we of course have to convert that to a table. So that's another problem which you may uh, be interested in, in getting involved in. So that's one thing. Um, that, but that also requires, for example, diagnostic photos. So if you have pictures of reptiles which show, which show diagnostic characters, they would be really interesting to us and we would be happy to post them. Um, I mentioned the literature and links to external database. All that stuff you can send us by email or if you have as tables, spreadsheets, you know, anything that's structured that we can import on a larger scale. So, um, oh, that's kind of the wrong orientation, but anyway, so one of the things you, I mentioned already, so once we have the characters, we can map them to phylogenetic trees, that's one thing for uh, potential collaborations. Also, you know, we need help with these ID tools, we need people who extract all this information from papers or books, you know, so we can code them into tables which are searchable. And uh, also, I mean, if you are good at uh, GIS, uh, Geographic Information System software or tools, um, you can help us to uh, code that kind of information into maps. So we, we just submitted a paper where you see the, the picture on the left, bottom left, you know, which basically maps patterns and colors and stuff to all the snakes in Europe, you know, so you know where different patterns and colors are found. Um, again, you know, if, if you have a, um, you know, pension for computing or programming, you can always help us, you know, with writing some scripts or something, you know, to extract data either from, from papers or tables or, you know, even from, from, from images, for example, if lots of images, we need some analysis. There are simple things you can do. You don't need to be really a hardcore programmer for these kind of things. Often it's enough to write, you know, simple scripts in Python or whatever you, know, you like to use um, to extract this kind of information or to automate, for example, extracting information from websites or emails or whatever, you know. So these are some things we always need help with. So one of the things I just wanted to mention, you know, at the end, because it's one of my pet peeves in our, 
I, I did my, my PhD on limb development and I'm, I'm, I have this long-standing interest in studying how characters arise from genetic information. So, so we have now a couple of snake genomes, for example, and one of the things we want to know is how you go from a snake genome to characters such as color patterns. You know, how do you generate these patterns in a snake? Uh, that's actually a pretty hard problem. And so it's, 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 it's something that not only requires, of course, anal analyzing a snake genome, but you also need some experimental um, approaches, you know, such as gene expression analysis. But if you're interested in one of these things, maybe you should let me know. Maybe there's something we can do about that. Um, it's, it's a very hard problem. It's not solved at all. Nobody knows where these snake patterns come from, how they are, you know, inherited um, and how they evolved on, on a genetic level. All right. I mean, that's basically already it. So if you go to the next slide, you see uh, my acknowledgments. You see uh, some of the people who helped with the reptile database, Yuri Hoshek is the actual database programmer and the web guy who did all the outline and the uh, PHP coding. Paul Freed is our photo editor. He helps with all the uh, photo management, collecting all the photos and indexing them. Harith uh, helped with uh, one of the GIS projects and identification tool uh, projects I mentioned. And Max Hammerman um, is working on the new website and ID tool that I also mentioned. Of course, there's all these hundreds and hundreds of volunteers who send pictures and data and to help reading papers and so on. I cannot even name all of these people because there's so many people who really help to contribute to the reptile database. And that's already it, you know, so thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are, if there are any. Um, sure, I can. I can ask Peter a question or two. Uh, Peter, I, I have a pretty large uh, collection of photographs that I took when I was working on homolopsid snakes. And those uh, show a lot of, of the uh, characters for the different uh, species. And uh, that may be something that you would be interested in, in using. Yeah, but so pictures are interesting for for, of course, the simple reason that people want to see pictures, but now since we have so many pictures, we also use them to code the characters. It's much easier to go through 100 pictures and then just click a bunch of boxes in a, in a spreadsheet, you know, to say these are green or blue or whatever color, you know, and banded snakes, then extracting that kind of information from a book or from a text. So we use pictures to, to get, like, at least the basic characters. If you get more complicated characters, it's better to have diagnoses where you can extract these kind of things, you know. Um, yeah, so so it's just useful, but um, even better if, if you have diagnostic characters on them. Well, that's that's what these are. These are photographs of diagnostic characters. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. And I should say that as a as a side comment, because there are many species descriptions published now which don't really show many diagnostic characters or maybe you show them only in one specimen so you don't really have any sense of uh, variation or you don't have any sense of sexual dimorphism or, you know, like ontogenetic changes. I mean, maybe they show like an adult um, animal, but they don't show like a juvenile, so you don't know that. And so, I mean, many of these things are not really published or they are not even known. So it's really important that we also get pictures of like babies or whatever, you know, so you see all these differences. Yeah, those uh, different life stages are are tricky. Uh, more, probably, let's say, more tricky with snakes than they would be with uh, lizards or frogs. Uh, because I think w with snakes, there are so many characteristics that, um, you know, are variable. But oftentimes, the descriptions are based on relatively few specimens. No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a, that's a general problem. But you see, that's another reason why you need databases, because you want to add more specimens once you get them. You know, it's, it's often not worth it to publish a new paper once you find a new specimen, which is a bit different, right? But if you have electronic resources, you, you could, at least in theory, collect all of these pictures, you know, but ideally you need us to organize that stuff somehow. Yeah. So that's that's the challenge here, actually. Sure.
Um, I mean, if, 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 as you know, if you just want to correct like a range, for example, if you, if you tell me there's one species which occurs in Arizona, but we don't have it for Arizona, I mean, you just send me an email and I can add it, right? That's not a problem. But if you have corrections for hundreds of species for whatever data, um, it's of course easier if you send me like a table and I can import it you know, to all the species. That I can do that too, depending a bit on the data. But do you have a specific format for that? Is it that like a, if if we send it in an Excel sheet, is useful to you or in a yeah that's that's yeah. perfectly fine yeah okay okay so 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 I mean obviously if you have a thousand pictures of for example Lori Witt who wrote the herpetology textbook he just sent us hundreds and hundreds of pictures you know uh, and Paul is sifting through them right now but the only thing we we need basically ideally you should send us a list of all the species names and the file names and the locations and also we have the localities. So one of the things we haven't done, for example, is we have not systematically recorded the location because we are not like a citizen science project like iNaturalist. But since we have so many pictures now, we should probably do that or we should at least encourage people to send their pictures also to iNaturalist so they are so the geo data is also recorded somewhere. Um, okay. It's just one example. Well what about herb mapper? You 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 extract data from them or share data with them? Uh, not systematically. I emailed uh, Mike Pingleton from HerbMapper just a few weeks ago to, uh, to ask him to send me a species list so we get an idea of what they have. And he sent me a list of like a couple of years ago, but not an updated list. Um, and we should we should put a link to them into the database as well. I mean, I, I have to admit, I, rem uh, I relied more on iNaturalist uh, in the past. But HerbMap has a lot of observations, although they have, of course, some uh, focus on North America and, and Europe and a few other places. But we get about 50,000 visits a month, okay? Um, so it's not bad. Um, well, if, if, if I charge like one cent, that would be 50,000, that would be uh, 500. It's actually not bad, yeah. <laughs> be five hundred bucks or so for each search, as so people do. I mean, we did have some funding from the EU a couple of years ago, which was not bad, um, but that expired. And uh, I mean, we occasionally get donations from people, so like, it's on the order of maybe a couple hundred bucks a year. It's not great, but at least it helps us to cover the server costs. I cannot complain because I'm a paid professor at the university, so at least I get paid for what I'm doing, and I'm. Uh, doing this partly during my work hours, I guess, so I, I can do that too. Um, but yeah, so it would be it would be a good idea if people who uh, submitted grants to funding agencies just basically budgeted maybe a thousand or a few thousand bucks for the reptile database if they can share their data with us as well. So that would certainly help. That's that's a good idea, actually. Then. Um, but that needs to be written also somewhere. <laughs> on... Yeah, I should. I have. I've mentioned that in our newsletter a few times, but I should probably remind people more um, regularly. Oh, well, put it on the uh, on the face of the database. It'll be on the absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I should do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you for that suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 really, it is. It is very important. I don't know. I mean. I haven't contributed. I uh, I'm embarrassed by that. But but in any case, it it should be something because most people these days have PayPal and PayPal account and uh, they can they can always do that. So if you have something on that on that first page that they that they go to see or even on every single page, you at the bottom of page you have those feedbacks and, and so on. Maybe there is something that you can add to each page and say, this is how you can support Reptile Database. I, I should actually, I have to make a note here. I should add the number of dollars we, we get, you know, so people can see that it's not that much. So it's actually worth donating something. The, the other things, and you mentioned about the maps, how can we, uh, because maps are actually in, in books and in publications, there are specific maps. You're going to add those or we can yeah, so, Well, this has been done by Shai Mary's group in Israel. So he digitized um, maps of most species with a team of people across the world, okay? And this is also done in uh, collaboration with the IUCN who does, who does all the maps 
for these red lists. So they, they have a separate mapping um, effort, but it's, it's to some extent coordinated. And uh, so we should have maps for most species. And so um, many of them, like I think 10,000 or so, were published in this 2017 paper. So we, so they are actually open access or um, a, I think they are, yeah, open, how do you call this, um, pub, public information now, okay? So everybody can use them. So we will post them, but Shai is working on a version two of them, like updated ones. And so hopefully we get the updates also so we can put the maps online pretty soon. I mean, again, as long as you don't have funding, these things take time because all this stuff has to be done in volunteer time, right? So that's why it's not happening overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one last question that I have, and I'll leave that to other people if they have questions, is on subspecies. I've been running into discussion with the with a lot of people about subspecies that, uh, for example, you have them on the on the side as, and the latest one that we were uh, talking about was the Eryx uh, in in Africa in Kenya actually, um, with the experts there that they said that uh, uh, there is no subspecies recognized. And the uh, reptile database, of course, mentions that that um, that there is a difference of opinion and so on. What is what is your approach in listing um, subspecies? And if there is a um, controversy on that, what would you do? Well, generally, as you know. Um... Subspecies have been described and they're recognized as such, so we just keep them as such, you know, but also there is this trend to elevate subspecies to species level. But that's also, you know, to a large extent, I would say a sociological issue because you don't see this phenomenon in the bird community. So there's 10,000 bird species, but also 10,000 bird subspecies. And apparently it's not very on vogue to in elevate the subspecies in birds. So it's a bit of a subjective thing, you know, depending on your species concept and stuff. I don't want to go into the, the details, but one solution that I have in mind, and I think we will implement that pretty soon, is that we simply treat all the subspecies as not a species, but just use them in the database in their own record. So each species and each subspecies has their own record in the database. And I think that's a, you know, a certain compromise because you will find all that stuff in your search for Eric's, you will see all the species, but also the subspecies listed. I think that in a way elevates them in terms of their recognition, you know, so um, people will see them when they search for them and they will see that they, for example, occur in different places. Um, but, you know, treating species and subspecies Differently is not a very objective thing, so uh, so it, it's a bit hard. You know, I mean, we, we can we can discuss it, but we, I don't want to go into the details now. So so maybe John has a, has an opinion about that too, so he can chime in if if, if he wants to. I, yeah, some species, depending on who you talk to, you know, there's some people that just want to do away with them completely. Other people say no, they serve a useful purpose. Um, until somebody looks at the molecules and sort of decides which populations form a species and which one belong to other lineages, all that sort of thing, you don't uh, you don't really have a good idea of of uh, whether or not those subspecies should be full species or just jump. Yeah, let let me add to that that. Um... You know, what people usually do is if, if you have variants which are a more or less defined geographic um, populations, I mean, it, it certainly makes sense to describe them as subspecies if they still can, you know, hybridize with other populations, which is often the case. In fact, it's often the case between species and it's even, you know, um, occurring between genera. I mean, like, for example, the, the Galapagos island iguanas, both the, um, the marine iguanas and the land iguanas, they can actually hybridize. Most people don't know that. but So they're not that far away evolutionarily, okay? But uh, it does everything in between, okay? And so if you, if you use a biological species concept, you get quite different um, 
you know, taxonomies, I would say. But, you know, for practical purpose, we just use DNA and morphology and geography to define species and stuff. So, you know, I think it's, it's a certain compromise, but, you know, you, can, you simply kind of do all the experiments, like breeding experiments, to, to really make more objective decisions. Yeah, well then, and of course, a lot of those aren't very practical. Uh, exactly. To do. And, and the other issue is that, uh, that I'm finding is, is that in some cases, we might have species that have been separated for 10 or 15 million years. It's still hybridized. And so, uh, to me, if, if, if you've got populations or species that have been separated for that amount of time, and they, they will still hybridize, maybe we should be rethinking how we treat those populations, because certainly they, they would be expected to be good species. After I mean, my, my, my uh, answer would be that it probably will be solved by simply using complete genome sequences. Once you sequence all these genomes, you just, you know, you, you, you of course, you look at uh, overall sequence similarity, but then you can also look at proteins or genes which determine um, genetic or reproductive compatibility. And so I think these problems will probably be solved within the next few decades, but it will take time. You know, right now we don't have many genome sequences of reptiles, maybe a, a few dozen or so, and that's it. And um, but it will come eventually. But it, it's it's funny because when we we have I make notes in the database about hybridization, and you can search for the word hybridize or hybridization, and you will find a few dozen species which do hybridize. It's usually in the comments somewhere. In fact. Um, the NCBI taxonomy treats hy hybrids differently. So the hybrids get their own taxonomy ID in the NCBI taxonomy uh, database. Um, um, I'm not even sure how you search for them, but they have like a, a, an X, you know, they just say Thamnophis, Sertalis, X, Thamnophis, whatever, you know, equis or whatever it's hybridizing. So they have def definitely separate gene or DNA uh, entries for them. Hmm. Yeah, those hybrids are are an issue, and I think it's uh, it's one of the things that uh, creates a lot of conflict in terms of when papers are being written. People want to argue about well, if they're still hybridizing, then they can't possibly be different species, and I I, I totally disagree with that because there's with reptiles, it seems that many of them retain this ability to hybridize. Uh, for a very, very long time, well after they're ecologically, morphologically easy to separate. Yeah, so it's, I would say it's an open question. We, we can, I mean, we have to do a separate presentation uh, or meeting to, to sort that out. Um, it's, it's a non-trivial problem, which has all kinds of intermediate stages and you know i mean that's it's just this uh, you know what do you expect from evolution you know that when species diverge it just lose reproductive uh, compatibility and there's some studies i can refer you to some studies um and uh you know people really see this when, when they do these breeding experiments which are just extremely time consuming i know a few people people have done this in a notice and a few other species and that's what you can see if, if they diverge genetically they lose gradually they are uh, reproductive compatibility and they become species. So you can really watch like speciation in, in some of these cases, you know, but you need a lot of time to do that. Okay. Well, if there is no other question, we, we can let Peter go. With... Thank you so much, guys, for joining and having me, all right? <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Peter. And... Thank my suit for doing that, yeah.